Now, just to tell you a little bit more about our facility, our facility has been in existence for more than 30 years. So our main focus is educating the public about these endangered animals that we have here, and then of course securing the survival of each of these species. So we will start our journey in what we call the Valley of Ancients. This is right behind me, and this is where we're gonna have a look at mostly our African animals. And then I will also be taking you down to Cheetahland where you actually get to meet our variety of big cats. So whenever you're ready, you can please follow me this way. So what I would actually love to give you the great opportunity to actually enter this exhibit first. So after you. vampire bats. Now because they only eat fruit, we call them fruit bats. Now they come all the way from Australia as well as in Malaysia. And then when these bats are fully grown, they weigh about 1.1 kilograms. But now when they open their eyes, they do have a wingspan of up to 1.5 meters. Now when people mm -hmm. see them, they're quite shocked to see bats this size. So remember, in the world, we get two types of bats. These are what we call mega bats, as mentioned. They're quite big. They live in sunlight and trees. They've got excellent eyesight, so they see us really, really well. Other than the smaller bats that most of us are used to. So smaller bats, they can't see well. They depend on the sense of hearing and the sense of smell to find food. Now annually there is about 22,000 of these larger bats that are being killed. So people actually kill them for sports and a lot of people that actually eat bats as well. So if you take a closer look right at the back side, you would actually be able to see uh, this is actually how we feed these animals. Now if you take a closer look right at the back, you might notice there's a small grey antelope. So this is actually called the blue data. So we're just going to move a little bit closer. So the blue data, they're actually the smallest antelope in South Africa. Let's see if I can get her to move a little bit closer. Come, Didi. Come. Come, Didi. Come. <laughs> So blue dakers are the smallest antelopes in South Africa. So when the dakers are fully grown, they've got a maximum weight of about four to six kilograms. Now this small antelope that you see right in front, she's actually fully grown. They don't get any bigger than this. Now if you take a very close look in the face of the daker, you would actually notice underneath their eyes, they do have what we call center glands. Now what they do in the forest, they rub those things of glance against the tree. And this is actually how they would mark their territories. So on the head, if you take a very close look, you can see she's got two tiny horns. How we identify between male and female, but male horns tend to be very longer. Darker in color. So the daker that we've just seen, this is Didi. She's actually our female daker and she's extremely, extremely friendly. Thank you, Tanil. Thank you. All right. So hopefully, uh, we will also be able to see some of our slots. <laughs> so folks, the slots that we do at our facility. So please just bear in mind, uh, we've got two blue and gold macaws in here. So both of 
these birds are fairly young. So if you're hearing a loud noise and sound, those are actually our two so if you take a close look at the top, you can actually see one of our slots. So they're fairly new at our facility. They have been with us for about five months. So the slots that we have, these are what we call the linear slots. So there are currently about six different types of species. Now these species of slots, they can be categorized in two different groups. So if you actually get to see them nice and close up, you would notice these are what we call two-toed slots. So they normally have two toes in front, as well as three toes at the back. Where your three-toed slots will have three toes in front, as well as three toes at the back. The vault slots are actually known to be the slowest mammals in the world. So everything that they do, it's quite slow. Most of the time, as you can see, they do remain motionless. Now because they remain motionless, that actually allows algae to grow on a slot head. Now what makes it possible for the algae to grow on their heads? Because their head's quite rough. So you can imagine when these slots are hiding up in sea canopies, they blend in quite nicely. So they've got quite a low body temperature. And that means slots that have got a very low, it's all a very slow metabolism. So slots normally come down only once a week. They come down from the top onto the ground only to come and do their toilet business. So that's how slow their metabolisms are. And they're quite strange. Slots, they so often when we take visitors on the east side, so this area is quite hot and humid. With all of the animals that we've seen in here, they actually live in tropical areas. So whenever you're ready, we're actually going to move on to our next exhibit. We are ready to kneel. So please come this way. So after you. Mm -hmm. All right, so in this next exhibit, we have one of my favorite animals. So you come around to this side, you would actually see her right at the back basking in the sun. So the small animal that we have in here, this is actually what we call a spotted neck otter. So folks, the spotted neck otters, these are the best swimmers of all freshwater otters. Now, we normally compare them to naughty kids because these are quite playful animals. And then most of the time you see them in the water. They would own out of the water and that is to bask on the rocks. Now these otters, they often like to eat fish and amphibians. But now at our facility we feed them chicken neck. So they like that as well. They do get killed by pythons, mm -hmm. eagles and crocodiles. Another big threat to them is actually us as humans. Now because these otters, they've got such a beautiful coat and such beautiful fur. A lot of people actually kill them for the fur to make the fashion coats. Now this is a fully grown otter. You can just imagine how many otters you have to kill for just one single fur coat. You might also find is that speckle, she's currently on the inside by herself. So we are in the process of looking for a mate for her. Now otters, they can live in groups of 2 to 20 and they would often yelp each other to actually catch fish. What we do with the Kango Wildlife Ranch with all of our animals, we actually do a lot of enrichment programs. Now when we do talk about enrichment, that's when we do lots of games, we play lots of activities with them to prevent boredom, frustration, as well as to keep them stimulated and giving them exercise in the process. As we will be moving along the way, I will be telling you a little bit more about our enrichment. So Speckle, she's quite active, so 80% of the time when we actually move along this way. So especially on a beautiful hot sunny day, you would always find her in the water, swimming up and down and actually doing flip-flops. Speckles! <laughs> yeah, I think she's too interested in that food she's getting now. Huh? Speckles! Come! Come! 
She's celebrating her birthday this month. Okay. Yes. 30 September. Proud, and she's 13 years old. Yes. She got this beautiful enclosure for her birthday when she turned 10 years old three years ago. Okay. All right, so in the next exhibit, we're actually going to have a look at our big scavenger birds. So as you're moving closer, you would actually notice that we have a total of five relatively large birds. Folks, you know, one that you see right behind a, hawk, a rock hiding away, this is actually called our marabou stork. Now the marabou storks are actually part of the stork family. So it's not the stork that will deliver your baby. So this one often comes, he eats or he steals your baby. Now when we move around this way, if you actually manage to get a close-up look at the marabou's legs, you would actually notice the color of the legs are white. However, the natural color of a marabou's legs, it's naturally, it's actually supposed to be black. But now the white you see on the marabou's legs, that's actually bird poo. So these birds, they do have the disgusting habit, they poo on their legs. Now you might wonder why are they doing this? This is actually quite clever. The white layer reflects in the sun. So this is how these birds keep themselves cool when it's very hot. And then because of the stinky smell, none of the insects wants to climb upon the legs. <laughs> so in summer, we actually call it a natural sunblock. But now with the COVID, we tell visitors it works very well for the social, social distancing. distancing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if you manage to have a look at the back on the rock, so these four birds, these are all vultures. And then vultures are classified as one of the most endangered birds. Now these birds often get electrocuted by power lines and then they do get poisoned. Now, if you have a look at the two large white birds, those are called Cape Vultures. And both of our Cape Vultures power lines. It's one of those birds who actually lost about 50% of the wingspan. The other one lost all over 90% of the wingspan. So where these birds cannot be fully rehabilitated, we actually use them at our facility to raise public awareness. Well, it's the beautiful brown bird with the pink neck and face. That's a leopard faced vulture. They are known to be the largest vultures in Africa. Not because of the weight, but if you look at the beak of that bird, you notice it's quite big and it's very, very strong. So what often happens, say for example, if all five of these birds get to a carcass, what the leopard face does, because his beak is strong enough, he can literally tear open the skin, so he can open up the carcass, so that the smaller vultures can also feed off this carcass. And then the youngest one, or the smallest vulture, is the one right at the back in the corner. So this is what we call an African whiteback vulture. Now, they are the most common vultures in Africa, but currently their numbers are drastically declining. So currently they are classified as critically endangered animals. Now, a lot of people believe in superstition. People also believe in traditional medicines. Now, because vultures in general in the world all of them, they've got excellent eyesight. A lot of people actually believe that vultures can see so well that they can actually see the future. So what happens to them now, people actually kill them, they eat their brains. So people believe if you eat the brain of the vulture, you would actually be able to see in the future. Now what a lot of visitors don't always realize is that the vultures, including the marabou storks, these are scavenger birds. They play a very important role in our ecosystem. Now we call them nature's disposal unit because they're responsible for doing the cleanup work. You can just imagine if there's a lion or a cheetah making a kill. If those animals had enough food to eat, they will walk away, they leave the rest of the meat. Now if someone does not come and clean that up, it attracts a lot of diseases and it attracts a lot of parasites. Now this is actually their job. So they prevent diseases and parasites from breaking out. Uh, just right at the back against the wall. So we have this up here. So we offer visitors the incredible opportunity. So we normally say you can compare your wingspan to those of the vultures. Now the three different colors that we have up here, these are actually the three, that does represent the three different types of vultures that we've just seen on the inside. All right, so if you're ready, I'm sure you know King Julian from Madagascar. 
So he's actually up next. So you can follow me along this way. Oh. Do you guys have any questions? Please feel free to ask as we move from enclosure to enclosure. If you take a close look on the inside, so in here we have what we call our ring-tailed lemurs. Now the ring-tailed lemurs, they are one of more than a hundred kinds of lemurs, which you would only find on the islands of Madagascar. So these lemurs, all of them, they lived in an absolute paradise up until the first humans arrived. Now today, nearly all kinds of lemurs are classified as endangered. Now the reason why they're classified as endangered that's mainly due to deforestation. So people are destroying their natural habitats. Now researchers have indicated that if the current rate of deforestation will continue in Madagascar, Madagascar will have no forest left within the next six years from now. Now with no forest left is that these animals, they have no future. Now at our facility, we do offer our guests the incredible opportunity to encounter some of our animals. So I would just like to inform you that these animals, they do form part of our encounter program. Now Kango Wildlife Ranch, we do support the Madagascar Fauna Group financially and their effort to save these animals from extinction. So normally a portion of the money that visitors pay to encounter these animals, we donate that to the Madagascar Fauna Group. So please note, we are also currently the only facility in Africa that support the Madagascar Fauna Group financially. So by supporting our facility, you will also be supporting the Madagascar Fauna Group. Alright, so right next to the lemurs, you would actually be able to see our beautiful pink and white birds. So these are actually our flamingos. And what is quite interesting is that a lot of people tend to ask us why flamingos are pink. Folks, what we feed our flamingos at our facility, it's called flamingo red. But now in the wild, these animals, they actually eat algae, they eat salt, they eat shrimp. Now what their food contains, it's actually called carotene. So it's actually the carotene in their diet that gives them their pink color. Now, if these birds don't receive any carotene at all, they will revert to their natural colors, of course, white. Now, quite often, one can also see some of them might have a bright pink color than the rest. The only reason, therefore, is the more carotene these birds eat, the pinker they would actually be. This area we are moving through is where we do our crocodile cage diving. We were the first in Africa to experience. We will be doing this in summer, not at the moment, as our crocs are still getting out of hibernation. All right, so folks, before we have a look at our actual hippos, I would actually love to show you these two skulls at the back. Now, when we do show a lot of people the pygmy hippos, a lot of people actually mistake them for babies, which they're not. Now, out in the wild, we get two types of hippos, so this is why we've got these two skulls. Now, the first or small skull, it's the skull of a pygmy hippo, so they weigh about 275 kilograms, and they can eat about 4 kilograms of food in just one day. And then right next to it, we have the skull of the Nile hippopotamus. This is also known as the African hippo. As you can see, they're much bigger. They weigh more than one and a half ton. Now, quite interesting. African hippos are very aggressive and very dangerous animals. They are responsible for killing more people in Africa per year, even more than a crocodile can kill per year. But now when one look at these sharp tusk and teeth, it's quite easy for us to assume that hippos eat meat. Hippos are actually herbivores. They mainly eat plants, grass, and fruits. But now you might ask yourself, if these are herbivores, why are they killing so many people? 
Uh, hippos are very territorial animals. If you go near them out in the wild, in order to protect themselves and the young ones, they're actually going to attack and they're going to kill us. I also believe one of the biggest mistakes that we, we as humans tend to make is that when people look at hippos, they see this big round fat animal and they tend to assume that hippos are slow. Now, in fact, hippos on land are extremely fast. So average speed of a hippo on land is about 45 kilometers per hour. But now to come back to the pygmy hippo, it doesn't mean because they're smaller that they're less aggressive. So what a pygmy hippo would lack in size, they actually make up in attitude. So we're going to move over and then we're going to have a look at our actual hippos. So the two hippos that we have, these are both pygmy hippos and both of those are fully grown. So they are age 31 as well as 32. Now the oldest hippo in captivity actually lived till 47. Now you might notice we also keep them separate. Now pygmy hippos, other than the African hippos, they are mainly solitary. Naturally, in the wild, you do find these pygmy hippos all by themselves. Now, it's also important to note is that pygmy hippos, you don't find them in South Africa. They're more in Western and Central Africa. But now in those areas, there's a lot of poverty. So what happens to these animals there is that people set traps for them and they kill them. Not only do they kill pygmy hippos to eat pygmy hippo meat, but they also sell the meat and this they do to generate income. Now currently, the pygmy hippos, they are classified as critically endangered animals. So their population is currently estimated at only 3,000 of these hippos still left out in the wild. We actually have a family of four. So in here, we have a total of Cape porcupines. Folks, the Cape porcupines are known to be the largest rodents in South Africa. They're also known to be the largest porcupines which you actually find in the world. Now the white porcupine that you see, this is our female Penny. Now Penny, she was actually rescued. Now she was found by a farmer on her way to Colored Store. The farmer found Penny when she was caught up in a trap. He actually noticed that Penny's face got so badly injured that one could actually see her nose or bone. Now, she was brought to our facility in 2012. But now, just a few months before she arrived here, someone also brought a male porcupine. So he was found alongside of the road where his mom got hit by a car. Now, we had this perfect idea. We actually introduced these two to each other. And it's like instantly, they fell in love. <laughs> and just a year later, these guys actually gave us two babies. So we call them the four Ps. We call them Penny, Prickles, Popcorn, and PJ. <laughs> so a lot of people also believe that porcupines can shoot out their quills. So this is not a fact at all. If there's any dangers coming closer to them, what they will do, they shake it, they make it look big. What they will try and do, they will try to run towards you to try and stab you with those quilts, but they cannot physically shoot it out. And then a lot of people tend to ask us as well, but how do these porcupines, how do they make babies with all of those quilts? <laughs> I just tell them they're quite careful when they do it. <laughs> And Tanil, they won't be having babies again. We've taken care of that. That's it's correct. just this family. Yeah. I just want to take a close-up here of Herbert, our pygmy hippo in the sun. Okay. All right, so if you're ready, in the next exhibit, we're actually going to have a look at two more cockroaches. And then the bees, we will be meeting next fairly young in comparison to the other two that we met a little bit earlier. If you take a close look on the inside, so in here we have two cape vultures. Now the bird right in front, uh, this is actually Puxley. So Puxley is a male, he's the youngest bird we have, so he's nearly about a year old. 
And then the other bird that you see at the top, that's our female Wednesday. And Wednesday, she is about two years of age. Now, both of these birds, they come from a wonderful organization that we call Valpro. So Valpro, it's an organization which is based in Pretoria. Now, their main goal is to rehabilitate and release these birds back out into the wild. Now, what Valpro does, they actually breed with these animals in order to release them in great numbers. But now it does happen once or twice a year. As the mating season for vultures comes to an end, those late pairs who mate and lay eggs, they often tend to neglect their eggs and their duties. Now, this is what has happened here. So Valpro stepped in after the eggs was neglected by the parents. They stepped in, they took the eggs from the parents and they incubated the eggs themselves. Eventually, when these two were born, they tried to reintroduce them to the parents, but they did not get along. Now remember the young vultures, they do depend on the old vultures to show them how to find nesting sites and how to roost. Now in a case like this, if an animal cannot be released out into the wild, Valpro then look at how they can use those animals positively. And this is when they end up at facilities like ours, where we then use them to raise public awareness. So one of the goals within the near future, we would actually love to open up vulture visits. So this is not going to be an encounter like any of our other animal activities where people physically get to touch these animals. But we hope by allowing visitors to enter this exhibit, we hope people will share a little bit compassion towards these animals. And then hopefully when they meet them back, positive manner so the whole idea is to have people going in seated on all right so just on the opposite side of the vultures we actually have the crocodiles so we're just going to move along this way we can where we can actually have a better look at them please feel free to ask if you have any questions so folks, on the inside, we have a total of eight now crocodiles. Now, if you come around this way, we'll get to see this one right over here. This is actually the largest crocodile that we have on the inside. Now, we do call crocodiles river edge hunters, and this is because most of their hunting it takes place in the water. So due to their perfect camouflage, is that crocodiles, they can stalk their prey. Now, they jump two meters out of the water. They grab their prey, they pull them back into the water, and then they proceed by doing the dead roll. So when a crocodile do this, they tend to lose a lot, a lot of teeth. Now, this is not a big problem. Now, if a crocodile lose or break a few teeth, they can actually replace it throughout their lifetime. So these are cold-blooded animals and reptiles. They don't eat in winter, because they've got a very low body temperature. Now, if a crocodile eats in winter, it means the food might not digest in the crocodile's stomach. There's a slight chance then that the crocodiles might get food poisoning and then they die. So crocodiles can live about 70 to 100 years. And they can actually go for one full year without eating anything. Now, last time we've actually fed these crocodiles was nearly about four months ago. So we're going to start feeding them, hopefully within the next few weeks. Now, other than just throwing big chunks of meat over for these crocodiles to eat, it is important for us to give them exercise, to stimulate their brains, as well as their bodies. Now, what we do in summer, when they do eat, the guardians, we make our way up to the jumping George jetty that you can see right in front. Now, we go stand right in front of the glass. We have a bell that we ring. Now, if those crocodiles are hungry, so they would actually come closer. Now we take a stick and we hook a piece of meat on the stick. Now we take the stick with the meat, we hold it over the barrier. The crocodiles then come, they jump up to two meters out of the water. So we don't feed our animals for entertainment by allowing them to jump out of the water for food. That's actually how we can give them their daily exercise. Alicia, will you tell us about that question? Okay, Tanil, we have a quick. Oh, thank you. 
So they say our enclosures look awesome. Thank you very much. Mio Cater, thank you for the compliment. Thank you very much. We, I have to just add to that, we have a maintenance team and our animal team. And every day, we, when we start the day, we clean the ranch and every night before we go home. So um, even though during COVID we didn't have any visitors here, we made sure that the ranch was well kept. Okay, so our total number of crocodiles. Um, so we've got this pool and where we do the croc dive. Yes. How roughly how many crocs do we have? All right, so this side with, which we've just seen, we have about eight now crocodiles and normally the crocodile cage diving area, we have three more crocodiles. So that's a total of 11 crocodiles for all visitors okay. to see when they actually visit us. Well, we've got a croc mm -hmm. here exiting the water. They also might appear to be slow, but they can move quite fast on That's land. Right. Just like our pygmy hippo, people can misjudge that. Okay, are we moving along, Tanil? Yes, so we are actually now done in the Valley of Ancients. So we're now going to have a look at our variety of big cats down in Chitale. We have a question. Yeah, so um, when we started the tour, we mentioned that the ranch was founded 34 Four years, years ago. ago. And then we, um, they want to know roughly how big is the facility? All right, so in total, our facility where we move as well as uh, guests move around, it's approximately about eight hectares of land. And then we do have our cheetah breeding center, which is across the road. And that's more or less about more than 90 hectares of land. Okay. We are exiting the Valley of Ancients and we just wanted to show you this beautiful site. <laughs> and we've got our critically endangered radiated tortoises just doing, their doing, thing. <laughs> doing what they need to do to save the species. <laughs> You hear that sound? <laughs> and <laughs> okay, let's just show you from this angle, and it's great to have visitors here, and even the animals are bragging and using this time to say thank you for visiting. <laughs> All right, so if you're all ready, we're now gonna head down to Chitalan. So we're gonna have a look at the variety of big animals. So the Tangle Wildlife Ranch main focus has always been endangered animals. Uh, educating the public about these animals with specific focus given to the cheetahs. So we're actually going to have a look at some of our cheetahs as well as our tigers, lions, beautiful cat courts. So, so if you're ready. We are ready Nila and we are excited. All right, so you can probably just see a little bit more about our facility. So we've got a beautiful bird park on this side which is also open for visitors to view uh, while they wait for their tours as well as beautiful snakes as well as meerkats. So these extra enclosures like our aviary and our snake park are open to the public to visit at their own time because normally when you come here your ticket is valid for the whole day and people actually spend most of the day here as we have restaurants and the kiddies play area and multiple activities. All right, so everyone, welcome to Cheetahland. So what will basically happen now, uh, when we do our guided tours with visitors, we enter the walkway, which is a high raised walkway, and we're looking down at all of these animals. So please follow me along this way. Oh. 
but we're actually going to have a look at our smaller African cat called a servo. Now he often loves hiding away, but I have to move his hands up. So the smaller cat that we have in here, uh, this is actually called a servo cat. Uh, his name is Mabuti. He's a male and he's already fully grown so he's already about eight years old now a lot of people seem to mistake them with mini mature cheetahs but these are totally different species so a serval's hind legs it tends to be much more longer than the front legs they've got sharp point little ears and then they do have stripes right behind their backs now a lot of people actually kill these cats they kill them for their skin they do sell the skin as a young cheetah or a leopard which is very rare and also very very expensive now just right next to the servo we actually have our two male cheetahs right in front so folks these two cheetahs these are actually two brothers so we call them Tain and Chichala and both of these cheetahs they are three years old now if you take a very close look at the cheetah especially in the face you will notice that the main identified characteristics of cheetahs are the cheetahs they do have those long black tear lines which run from the eye to the sides of their mouths they have small solid black spots this makes them very different from those of leopards and jaguars now cheetahs they've got a sleek body and they've got long dog like legs now this combines to make cheetahs the world's fastest land mammals on earth so when cheetahs are fully grown they can reach a speed of 120 kilometers per hour now they run so fast they accelerate zero to 70 kilometers in just two seconds so cheetahs they do have in large hearts and bronchies this helps the body to cope with extreme energy output as it's running faster now in the wild if a cheetah catches a prey they need to eat their food as soon as possible their food is often being stolen away by higher carnivores such as hyenas and lions and then the current population of the cheetahs in the wild it is estimated there's only 7,000 cheetahs left folks these cheetahs they often come into conflict with us as humans a cheetah they require big land and open flat spaces to catch their prey the same big land and open spaces that we require to plant our crops but now the most concerning factor that influences the cheetah population is actually their poor genetic makeup. It has been proven that cheetah population once felt so low that massive inbreeding occurred. And this makes them highly susceptible to diseases. Now we at the Kangal Wildlife Ranch in 1988, we have managed to set up our own cheetah breeder center. Our breeding center is across the road, it's more than 90 hectares of land. Now, ever since we started to breed with cheetahs, we started off with a total of 20 adult cheetahs. But now, over the years, up until today, there were already more than 350 cheetahs that were born at our facility. Folks, the idea is not to release these cats out into the wild. We cannot release them if we haven't found solutions for what is happening to them out there. So what we do, we swap them around with facilities all over the world. Now at the end of the day, it is important to build up those genes and to make it strong again. So if it does happen within the next say 10 or 50 years from now, if there's no more cheetahs left out in the wild, then captive facilities like ourselves will then look at replacing them back out there. Now this can be quite a challenging process. It is something that can be done. Now it has been done with radiated tortoises. So they would have been extinct now if, if it was not for facilities like this. Now often a lot of guests often ask us, how do we keep these cats active? So on a daily basis, we actually have our animal stuff that goes in. So some of the activities that we do with them, we play soccer. It's literally kicking a ball and these cats actually chase after it. But what we can also do, because they've been hand raised from baby time, we walk into these exhibits and we put the cheetahs on a leash. 
Now we can take them for daily walks on the premises or at the breeding center across the road. Now for them it's quite nice because they get to stretch their legs, they get to see, smell and experience something totally different. So with the different cats, we actually do lots of different activities. <laughs> Now some of the visitors that you can see are actually encountering our cheetahs. Now Cheetah Preservation Foundation, this is actually a non-profit organization. So the money that visitors actually spend to encounter any of our animals, it goes back to the Cheetah Preservation Foundation. It helps us to pay for medical fees and it also helps us to actually feed these animals. Okay, thank you, Tanil. Also with regards to the leash training that she mentioned, we every now and then have visitors with special abilities as we like to say and training our cheetahs to be used. Oh I have to stop, look at this. We have just spotted our leopard Nanji. As I was saying, so we train our cheetahs to also encounter with people in wheelchairs and help make that dream come true. So Nanji has now spotted one of her caregivers. All right, so this beautiful cat that we can see on the inside, this is our beautiful African leopard called Nanji. So this is actually a female. Now she is fully grown, she is about 9 years of age and she's got a weight of about 60 kilograms. Now normally when one look at the male leopards, they tend to be quite big. So male leopards, they can actually weigh up to 90 kilograms. Now this makes leopards to be the fourth larger cats in our cat family. A leopard can run 58 kilometers per hour. So they can jump 6 meters forward and 3 meters up. So these are beautiful animals, but they can be very aggressive and very dangerous. So leopards are known to kill a prey that weighs more than double its own body weight. So they can carry those prey run about up until 11 meters in a tree. So often visitors also tend to ask us the differences between cheetahs and leopards. So easiest way to tell these part is by looking in the face. So cheetahs, they do have the long black tear lines running from the eye to the sides of their mouths. So when one look at the leopard closely in the face, you can see she doesn't have those long tear line markings. Now there is a difference in the spots. So cheetahs have small solid black spots, but leopard spots quite big and it's, uh, it, it's called a rosette. So that simply means it looks like a small flower. So they normally have like a blondish marking in the middle with the black circle on the outside. Now I would also love to inform you what you're currently seeing happening at the back. That's actually an encounter now offer visitors the incredible opportunity to actually do leopard feeding so this is what you can see happening there now because our leopards actually love to climb trees so as a form of exercise for them so what we do if you take a look right in the middle of nanji's exhibit you can see there's quite a big wooden pole so one of the activities that we do with her, because she climbs very well, we hang a big chunk of meat at the top. She will then jump and climb till she gets the food down. Now Oatsorn, that's also known for very hot temperatures. Now temperatures can go as high as up to 50 degrees. So what we do with these animals, we would also give them lovely blood ice lollies. At the same way we eat ice cream to cool off when we feel hot, but we actually make it quite nice for them. So what we do, we take blood of an animal, we mix it with water and then we put in a different animal scent like a donkey ear or a snake skin. We freeze this all together, then we take this block of bloody ice, put it in a box, fill it with straws and we hide it for them to find. So those are just some of the examples I would love to share with you is how we prevent boredom and frustration among all of our animals. Thank you, Tanil. So in the next exhibit, we've got two fully grown white lions. 
Now, both of the lions that we see in this exhibit, both of them are actually fully grown. They are currently aged 15 years. And these are what we call white lions. So white lions, they do have a recessive gene. So these are not albinos. So albino tigers and lions, they normally have the red eyes. Folks, the white lions, they've been extinct in the wild for 12 years. And this is because of the canned hunting and the trophy hunting. So a lot of people often tend to ask, but what exactly is canned hunting? So in short, people actually use these animals to make money. So they literally breed them to slaughter them. So they would allow these animals to have babies, but when the babies are big and fully grown, they would release them into a small area. And then they allow visitors to come and pay lots of money to come and shoot and kill these animals. So I would love to inform you is that we at the Kangoo Wildlife Ranch, we are wholeheartedly against the canned hunting. That's actually one of the reasons why we don't breed with lions, because we don't want to be associated with canned yes. hunting at all. Now, even though if these lions were having babies here, we wouldn't have any space to keep them. So it's useless for us in breeding them here. The main reason we have them here, they are all here as ambassador species. We actually use them to raise public awareness. Now, what you'll get to see that the male lion, what he's doing now, he actually does this about 21 hours a day. So he will spend most of his time to sleep or rest. Females are more active, tend to do most of the hunting. So when a female lion finds a prey and kills it, a male lions often eat first. So lions are extremely social animals and they live in family groups called prides. So a pride consists of 5 to 45 members of lions. So these are known to be the second larger cats in our cat families. Tigers are, of course, the larger cats. All right, so in the next exhibit, we're actually going to have a look at our tigers as well. So we've got a beautiful snow white tiger in the next exhibit called Nevada. We're on 47 minutes to kneel. Okay. 47, yes. Mm. And Taji. All right, so everyone right in front, meet Taji. This is our white Bengal tiger. Now, Taji, she's currently the oldest cat at our facility. So this year, she will actually be 17 years. And if you manage to have a look in the exhibit right at the back, we also have our beautiful snow white tiger, Nevada. Now, Nevada, we call him a snow white tiger because he was born with hardly out any stripes. So the first snow tiger that were born in Africa was actually a female and she was born here at our facility. Now, tigers, these are the larger cats in the cat family. You find them throughout Asia. Now, of the original nine subspecies of tigers, is that three tiger species are already extinct. Now, the current population of tigers in the wild, it is estimated at only 4,000 tigers left. Now, these cats, they are losing their natural habitats and they are being poached. Now, they are being poached for the body parts. So people actually use their body parts as traditional medicines. Now, this is being sold on the black market for lots and lots of money. And then sadly, researchers have actually indicated within the next 10 years from now, you won't find tigers left out in the wild. Sadly, the only place that you would actually be able to see them would actually be in parks and zoos like ours. So folks, when a tiger is fully grown, they can eat about 30 to 40 kilograms of food in one day. Now, when I say they eat 30 to 40 kilograms of food a day, it often means they would not hunt for the next two to three days. Tigers can see six times better than us humans in the dark. They are five times stronger than human athlete. Now, what makes them such special and unique cats is that no two tigers have the same stripe pattern. Now, all of them are unique, just like our human fingerprints. Now, we actually keep these two separate. As tigers in the wild are mainly solitary. So naturally, in the wild, you actually find tigers by themselves. What we do with these cats throughout the days, we actually rotate them. So that means that tomorrow we put Nevada at the back right in front where he can actually have the nice big swimming pool all for himself. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. When we get to the end of the catwalk, will you please tell us about how 
our visitors at the EFO can sponsor our beautiful animal family. Okay. This is the back of the leopard enclosure. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, sadly our tour has basically now come to an end. So I would just like to thank all of you for watching. Now, some of our activities that we actually allow mm -hmm. visitors to do on the premises, it's actually doing our encounters. But if you're quite far from us, and if you would also like to sponsor anything towards our facility, you're more than welcome to do so. Now, if you have a look up this site, you would actually sign, you would actually find all of the different animals we have up here. They're basically all up for adoption. So how these programs work, if people do adopt one or more of these animals, they do so for one year. Now, this basically works as a sponsorship. You help us to do the funding and then we give you the adopt the parent lots and lots of different benefits. So if you would like to make a contribution to our facility, you are more than welcome to just do a normal uh, a donation towards us or you're more than welcome to adopt any of these lovely animals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tenille. <laughs> okay, so we have a moment now. Uh, we have a moment now where if there's still any questions someone has and from our side i just want to thank Tanil for taking us on this journey thank you very much we Was loved every pleasure? minute of it and thank you to the efo for giving us this opportunity to share the facility and to show you a bit more of what we do here okay i think on someone on it i'll show them the rest of the walkway so we've got uh, Quartz Express saying thank you for the cool tour. Thank you very much. It was a <laughs> pleasure. And tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock uh, South African time, we will have breakfast with the cheetahs. Some of you joined us last year will remember that feed. Okay, so we're here at our backyard fox enclosure, but they're hiding. So these two had their little home in a dam wall on a farmer's property and then floods came and the farmer actually found them covered in mud. They couldn't find the mom and dad and they brought them to the ranch and we were gifted an incubator by one of our adoption members and that saved their lives and they are now growing old here at our facility. Oh, wait a minute. Well spotted, Alish. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah, they are. Becky and Banded. Brother and sister. They were so tiny, they fit in one hand. And here they are today, healthy, loved and fully grown. Okay, so Fun Kitty asks, uh, she, uh, they say that the wall by the serval was low, can't they jump that high? 
Well, servals, they can jump pretty high. So normally about three to four meters up. They're specifically known to catch birds out of the air. Now that prevents them from fly, uh, uh, sorry, not flying, but jumping <laughs> up that high. But also we do have electric fencing around uh, facilities. Now the electric fencing, it's not set at a very high volt. It just gives a good vibration to actually scare them back. So she can't get over to the other side. I think also because we're on an elevated walkway, yeah. it does seem like the That's very low. fence was low, but yeah. it's in fact quite high. Yeah. And then someone asks the bat-eared foxes, are they part of the phoenix family or are they their own subspecies? I'm not sure. I have okay. to find out for you. Okay, yeah. we will have a look into that. Any other questions you see, Alicia? Hey. So we're finishing off on our catwalk. So I'll show you our cheetah land foyer and we had quite a few EFO members that signed up and sponsored some of our animals. So we have a family tree up here and we add your name on a plaque to honor you for sponsoring one of our family members. As we like to say, adding a wild new branch to your family tree. So this enclosure over here is where we give you the opportunity to interact with our lemurs and we have three species in this enclosure the black and white ruffed lemurs who are also endangered our ringtail lemurs and brown lemurs so here you see our lemurs approaching the visitors Okay, Hi. so Tanil has our answer regarding the foxes. All right, so I was actually not quite um, sure what the term means, but the back eared foxes. Mm -hmm. They are family of the fox and the phoenix family. Okay. So that is correct. Wow, thanks for that, Tanil. Thank you. Okay. So we wanted to say thank you and see you all tomorrow morning.